Well, the day has finally arrived, and uh, how beautiful that you're receiving First Communion on this Feast of the Ascension. And I think this helps us to appreciate uh, why we receive Communion, why we receive the Eucharist in the first place. Um, the Feast of the Ascension is the second heartbreak for the 11 in this case, because after the death of Jesus, um, Judas Iscariot killed himself because he had handed over Jesus to the authorities to have him killed. And I don't think that Judas understood that that was, was going to happen, but at any case, he felt terrible grief afterwards. So the gospel says the 11 were assembled and they came to where Jesus was. Now, at this moment, as the scriptures are describing it, not in the gospel, but in the Acts of the Apostles, it was 40 days after Easter. And the first heartbreak for the apostles was that event, that cross. They would have never thought, walking with Jesus and seeing all the miracles he did and hearing all his teaching, that they were going to kill him and put him on a cross to die. But that's what happened. So take yourself back to Good Friday, and there the apostles are, and Jesus is hanging on the cross, dying and bleeding to death. And first of all, uh, Peter realizes what he had done. And Jesus told him, before the cock crows three times, two, two times you will deny me three times. And when that happened, he wept bitterly. Now, I suppose all the apostles were gathered around the cross, at least from a distance. But they probably didn't stay there, except John and only in John's gospel, because if they were doing this to Jesus, what were they going to do to his closest followers? That must have been in their head. But I think what they felt even more than their fear was their sadness, seeing their master dying like this, and he was taken from their midst by death. So then on Easter morning, three days later, when there's news that the tomb was empty, different reports, and Matthew says, uh, Go out and tell the people a story that they robbed the, the grave. But they thought that maybe he was taken, and these angels appeared and said that he's been raised from the dead. And so they rushed back to tell the 11 that he's, he's been raised up. And we heard for three weeks during this Easter season all these stories of appearances of Jesus. And the apostles now were overjoyed. The Lord had come back to them, and they were so happy. So on this day, when he said that he had to leave and go back to the Father. There was their second big, big heartbreak. He was leaving again. That's what we celebrate. And of course, we're celebrating the memory of it 2,000 years ago. It's not being repeated. And we are trying to enter into that space. And this is an important place to enter into. Because if we can have that sense, that feeling of, of Jesus not with us, how much more important when we receive him and his spirit. So, in the liturgical life, we celebrate this. And Jesus says today, uh, last Thursday actually, but we celebrate it on Sunday, uh, I'm returning to the Father. And he says, and I have to do that. Because if I don't do that, you can't receive my spirit. And I really think this condition is important. He's describing a need to be empty inside, a sense that he was not present, so that when he is, does become present, it's a powerful, powerful, filling thing. Now, there is one time in the year that we do this in a, another liturgical way, uh, and most of the church, our Catholic church, has not been to a Holy Thursday, um, Last Supper celebration, or Good Friday, or especially Holy Saturday, and for the few that go to Holy Saturday, probably some go one time and then don't come back because it's a three-hour service, and they say, "Way, well, that's way too long. Three hours, uh-uh, not again. But on Holy Thursday, when we do the washing of the feet and we celebrate the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, this is my body, this is my blood, at the end of the Mass, instead of putting the leftover Eucharist there in the tabernacle, we take it in the sacristy and lock it up. And we leave the doors of the tabernacle open. And the reason is because we're celebrating that and Jesus going into the tomb and his living presence not being there. And then on Good Friday we come and when you walk in the church, the tabernacle's open, the doors are open, there's no Eucharist in there. 
If you come on Holy Saturday during the day, the tabernacle doors are open, there's no Eucharist in there. And we're celebrating Jesus as being in the tomb and not being alive for us. Now that is meant to evoke in us a feeling of a kind of an emptiness so that when we receive, it's powerful. That's what I think Eucharist is about. Um, you guys wrote letters to me saying that you want to receive and they were um, incredibly honest. Um, some said, I can't wait till this is over. Some said, I, and, and I suspect some came to class every week angry. Mom, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to go? And it made me think of a friend, of, not a friend, but a classmate of mine, Richard Telford. And for me to remember that name is going back to 1964, the last time I saw him in class, because I went to the seminary, never saw him again. And I still remember that name, but I'll tell you why. He was next to me in the pew for First Communion. And I grew up in a time, you guys have no idea how strict it was and how strict the sisters were um, in our parish. And a, a pinch on the arm if you talked in church, it was a good one too. But Richard Telford, and by the way, I think you practiced with a host before that was not consecrated or blessed, just, you just so you would taste it and it wouldn't be a surprise. Well, they didn't do that in our day. And Richard Telford always, when we were doing our practices, he'd crawl under the pew and do just the dumbest stuff. And that's with the, with the nuns there who would knock him on the head. And he just was a goof. So when the day for First Communion came and he received, he came back to the pew and he was crying. He said, I don't like it. It tastes terrible. I never forgot this. I never forgot this because this guy went through uh, all this training for two years and it just didn't click. He didn't get it. So I say to myself, I wonder how many people don't get it. How many people receive their First Communion and they, you know, because that's what you do and it's time to do it. So I want to describe something different to you. First of all, last night in the sacristy, um, Joannes and her husband Brian were there. They were reading uh, the scriptures at Mass, and their little three-year-old girl was with the grandparents. And we were talking about the three-year-old girl because when she was born and when she began to walk, when they'd walk up to communion, uh, the mommy would walk the little girl and when I would go to bless the little girl, she'd back off. She, she was afraid of me. And didn't, you know, it's typical little kids. But eventually, when she was about two and a half, she could come up and I could bless her and she'd even smile at me. Well, Joanna has told me last night that she, for the longest, has been calling me Jesus. Um, and the reason is because they would come to church and the parents are trying to teach her this is God's house and we're going to go to God's house and pray to Jesus. And then this freak comes out in clothes like this, the only one dressed like this, and I say things, watch, watch what happens. The Lord be with you. Excuse me, Catholics, hello. The Lord be with you. Okay. So this one person dressed funny says a line, and all these people respond back. So this little girl is seeing this. And then she's mixing it all up, and this is Jesus is where Jesus is, and we pray to Jesus. So she thought it was Jesus. It's not a bad way to be mixed up with somebody. And, and so um, they told me last night, she no longer calls you Jesus. So what happened? She grew. She grew in her understanding. And she could make the separation now. Understand it perfectly? No, no. I don't know if we ever understand it perfectly my favorite line in this gospel today says it so clearly. In the gospel, it says, The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Ooh, I like that. They worshipped, but they doubted. And I'll tell you, if you had a hard time going through these two years, good. Good, because it's a good lesson. Because as you grow up and you receive Jesus hundreds and thousands of times, there will come a time in your life, I am sure, where you're going to wonder if God is even there. When you go through suffering or pain or are told you have cancer or someone dear to you dies. And we all do this at some time in our life. God, where are you? Jesus, how could you let this happen to me? 
So one of the reasons I think that we come to communion is to continually grow deeper and closer to God, especially through Jesus' Son. And the best way I can use to describe this, because first of all, even, is this baby baptized yet back here? Is this baby baptized? There's as much Jesus in this baby as there is in me, or as there is in the Pope. There's no way you can push Jesus out. We don't have control over Jesus. God loves us, and he belongs to us, and whether we're people faith, whether we're with him, God for us, really. But why do we do things like this, like a communion? Well, I grew up in a family. There were six kids, and um, a very German and Austrian family, very... Uh, especially my dad's side, kind of cold. Uh, they're big family farmers, and nobody ever said things like, I love you, please. I don't remember hugs and kisses growing up. It just, we didn't do it in our family. A lot of families, even here, even with Latinos and Filipinos that are very emotional and emotive, Italians, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that everybody says, I love you. I hear it more now than ever. I, I, men uh, in my life, uh, they talk to me on the phone. They say, uh, love you, Father Perry. Bye. I never heard that. And we didn't kiss. We weren't huggers and kisses in my family. But I read a book when I was a young priest. I love this book by Father Foley. And it's called Signs of God's Love. That was the name of the book. And in it, he makes a comparison. He talks about the sacraments. These are what he was talking about, the seven sacraments. And he says, they're like a kiss. They're like a kiss from God. You know, if someone loves you, they don't have to kiss you to prove their love. They don't have to hug you. They don't even have to say the words. You know when you're loved. But what a difference when it is said. What a difference when you are hugged and when you're kissed. Now think of it. Here's a pair of lips over here. Here's a pair of lips over here. And somebody says, I love you. And this one says, I love you too. Oh, I love you so much. I love you too. Now, is that love? No, it's a kiss. You know, I, I suppose you could do something like this to show love. I'm not going to hurt you, okay? Okay. If they, say this was my little niece, and I said, oh, I love you so much. She said, I love you too, Father Perry. And then I went like this and touched your nose. I, that could be the way that we show love, touching somebody's nose. It's kind of freaky, kind of freaky. But no, we kiss, we kiss. And it's a sign of love, and it communicates love, and it can make love be felt and be present. And it's a beautiful thing. A kiss is a way of sharing love, but it isn't love. It's two bodies touching. So we come to the Eucharist, and Jesus wanted a way to be with us, to be within us, but most of all, for us to know it and appreciate it, to know it and appreciate it. So he said, I know what I'll do. I'll be your food, food for your spirit. So when you come to this meal... Just like I did on this night, the Last Supper, he took bread, blessed it, broke it. He said, this is my body, eat it. This is my blood, drink it. And you might say, why would he do that? Well, why do we kiss? Why do we hug? Somehow it makes love be felt and be present. And Jesus said, I want you to know I love you. I want you to know that I want to live in you be a part of you, and especially when life is tough and hard and broken, that you believe and trust that I will be there for you and will get you through this. And it's a really important message. The older you get, the more you'll understand it. So today, this is such a gift. We come here on a day that we celebrate that he left us and we were empty. We recall times like when the tabernacle is empty and we say, where are you? And we might have even, even heard our parents or someone in the family saying, God, where are you? Why is this happening to me? Where are you? We may have heard that. But this is a day where we say, I know where you are. And somehow in that bread, you become my food. 
I eat your presence. And like food that gives life to my body, you give life to my spirit. And I believe that. Do I understand it perfectly? No. Do I doubt? Maybe. But I do believe it. And that's what we celebrate with you and for you this first time today as you receive your first communion. Now, I don't know if any of you ever did this, but sometimes I'm giving out communion and somebody comes up and, and I'm not sure if they know what they're doing. And, and it turns out they've never received communion before, but they take the host because they imitate what their parents did. And then as they take it and eat it, their mom comes up like two people behind. They, the kid got a little separated and she goes, oh, no, no, no. They weren't supposed to receive. They hadn't made the first communion. So if any one of you ever did that as a little kid, don't worry about it. This is your real first communion that you've prepared for, even when it was a little difficult. And today, I hope that you are joy-filled and that you say with all your heart, Lord, come into my life. Fill me, love me, be with me, and never, never leave me. Please stand.